Hello, everybody. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Let me make sure I've got this working. Okay. My name is Bruce Stewart. I'm from Shoreline Orthopedics I'm here in Holland. I see some familiar faces out here. Um, I'm going to be talking about knee injuries and athletes tonight. So this is going to be kind of an interactive presentation. We've got a small enough group that if people have questions and they want to raise their hand, um, feel free to do so. Okay. So we're going to be talking about common knee injuries in athletes. Um, they're a relatively common injury. Many occur during actual cutting activities, running, cutting, jumping sort of activities. We're going to be focusing on more acute injuries, meaning things that actually happen when you're out in the field rather than chronic injuries that just kind of cause pain over time. The ones we're going to talk about today are going to be tears of the ACL, meniscus tears, um, MCL sprains and tears, tears or sprains of the LCL, PCL, and then patella dislocations. So we'll go into each one of those here in, in some detail. We're going to start off with tears of the ACL. So many people have probably heard of this. You might watch TV if you're following sports. You might have heard of athletes having ACL tears and possibly being out for the season or other things. So very common injury in athletes. We're going to talk about exactly what is the ACL anyway. We'll talk about how it's injured, um, what kind of things might put somebody at risk of tearing their ACL. How do you know if you've torn it? What, um, what are the signs? How do we make that diagnosis? And then if you do have an ACL tear, what do we do about it? Is it something that has to be fixed surgically, or can you live without your ACL? How do we fix it if we are going to fix it? And then we'll talk about recovery and what to expect with that, and what are the chances of success? There are actually things that can be done to help prevent this injury as well, so we'll touch on those. So first of all, with the what is the ACL? So H ACL stands for anterior cruciate ligament. Anterior means in front, and cruciate means cross. So you have an anterior cruciate ligament, and you have a posterior cruciate ligament. So you have one in the front and one in the back, and they make a big cross or a big X right in the center of the knee. You can see on this screen, um, right in the center of the knee, you can see where it says ACL. That's in the front going up, and then right behind it is the PCL running in the opposite direction. They're crossing in the center of the knee. It's an important ligament in the knee. It helps to stop the lower leg or the tibia or shin bone from sliding forward and rotating on the upper leg or the femur. It also helps it to stop it from twisting. So the ACL has two functions. It stops the lower leg from sliding forward like this and stops it from twisting like that. It's most important with cutting, pivoting, twisting sort of activities. So you can tear your ACL and live a pretty normal life. You can walk in a straight line, you can ride a bike, you can do a lot of things. But when you go to plant and cut and change direction, suddenly that's when the ACL really kicks in and provides that stability for the knee. Most of the time this is torn, it happens from something that doesn't look like a particularly significant injury. Most of the time, it's an athlete out running in the middle of the field. They go to cut and change direction. The foot stays planted. The knee goes the opposite direction. Um, it's not usually some spectacular hit in football or some major collision. It's frequently something that no one really even noticed that anything happened. About 80% of them are non-contact injuries. 20 or 30% of them actually come from a collision. But most of the time, it's, it's not anything um, particularly impressive. People, when they come to see me with an ACL tear, it's almost as if they read a script beforehand about what they were supposed to say to describe <laughs> what they have. So it's a very, very classic description. People almost always say they felt or heard a pop. Many times they'll describe the feeling that their knee actually shifted out of place and then kind of shifted back in. Um, most people will have pretty rapid swelling of the knee, meaning that within an hour or two, they start to notice the knee's getting big. Um, and certainly by the next day, most people are going to have a fairly swollen knee. Um, there can be pain in other parts of the knee because with all that shifting and twisting as it's happening, multiple things are frequently injured. So it's not always just the ACL. And a lot of times afterwards, they might feel this, this happens, and then they kind of want to test it a little bit, and they'll just feel, whoa, that knee feels pretty unstable. So a lot of times people say almost all these things verbatim. It's really amazing how, how much similarity there is in the stories that people tell. 
what are some of the risk factors? So why does this happen to some people and not others? Sometimes it's just bad luck. But there are actually risk factors that, are, that go beyond just bad luck. So one is having a relatively large, what's called Q angle. That's when the hips are out here and the knees are down here. So that force, that vector, can put you at a higher risk of having an ACL tear. So you can see this picture up on the screen of a woman on the right side there and, the, um, and a man on the left. Um, there's a difference in that Q angle. You see, the, in general, women are going to have broader hips. That angle that's made between the hips and the knees is usually higher in women. So that's one of the reasons that women are at higher risk of having this injury. Um, that's called valgus alignment. So that, that's one reason for increased um, risk of ACL tears. There's also something called the femoral notch. That's inside the knee here. That's this little area where the ACL lives. You can see there's kind of almost a little hole between the sides of the bone. The ACL lives in there, and women tend to have a smaller one, um, and there's variation just from person to person. How big is that notch? Well, if you have a small notch where that ACL lives, and you suddenly have an, a mechanism where the knee does this, it can almost act like a guillotine, where the ACL is being sheared off or cut by the edge of that bone there. So a small notch potentially puts you at increased risk. The shape of the way the, femur, or the tibia and the femur come together, the shape of that can also sometimes put some, person, some people at higher risk. Most people have a slight slope on the back of their leg here, on the back of the tibia. If that slope is really high, it's going to tend to make the femur naturally want to drift back further. So there are all kinds of little subtle things anatomically um, that can make one person at higher risk than another. Many of these are inherited factors. So just like we kind of look like our parents and our siblings, um, we have similar facial structures. A lot of people have similar structures of their knee. And so many times I'll see people who come in with this injury and they'll say, oh, my sister had it or my aunt tore her ACL or my dad tore his. So it's frequently something that we'll see kind of clustered in families. So it's not all just random chance. There are biomechanical reasons why this might happen too. The way you land can put you at increased risk of tearing your ACL. So remember how we were talking about that Q angle and how that having your knees kind of relatively in like this puts you at higher risk. So when women come down, they recruit their muscles in a different order than men typically will. So women tend to fire their quads a little bit more, um, whereas the hamstrings, which fire and actually help to pull your leg back, tend to be recruited a little bit later in the jumping and landing process in women than in men. Luckily, there's actually stuff you can do to try to train your muscles to um, fire in the appropriate sequence. Here in this picture, we can see a, um, a woman who's about to tear ACL and then does. So you kind of see a time-lapse frame. See how the knee suddenly kind of caves in right there? It's the same thing we see in this jumping sort of um, drawing. Or you're coming down and landing like that rather than coming down landing with your knees right over your toes. So this is a relatively safe position. That, not so much. So there are also hormonal effects. There have been several studies looking at the menstrual cycle and um, when women have torn their ACL. Um, and is there some correlation between certain times of the month and when the ACL actually occurs? And there actually is. So um, one study looked at this. They had women who tore their ACL. They had the athletic trainers with all this stuff just ready, sitting on the sidelines. And as soon as there was an ACL tear diagnosed, they took saliva um, samples and were able to check estrogen and proestrogen levels in the saliva, which correlated with um, the blood levels of that, so they could know exactly where in that cycle um, women were. And there was a relative trend for having higher incidence of tearing their ACLs in the first few days of the menstrual cycle. Um, women typically have looser joints than men, just the, there's a little bit more movement there. Um, and then there are other environmental factors that might make somebody um, happen to tear their ACL? What kind of shoes are you wearing? What kind of surface is it? Um, what sports are you playing? There are certain sports that are really high risk, and there are other sports that are fairly low risk. What um, are the weather conditions, and how much are you playing? One thing we do know is that ACL tears tend to happen in scrimmages and games. So they can happen in practice too, but they're much more common in scrimmages and games. And so the number of ACL tears is directly proportional, or the rate of ACL tears is directly proportional to how many hours an athlete spends in competitive sports. So if you said, I don't want to take the risk of tearing my ACL, 
the number one thing you could do would be cut down the number of hours you're scrimmaging and playing because that's where you're most likely to injure yourself. So it seems like there's sort of an ACL, I'll get you in one second. It seems like there's sort of an ACL epidemic out there when you're watching sports and you know people in the community who are having these injuries. And why, does, why are these rates going up? They're not, the rates aren't going up, but people are playing sports so much more in a competitive fashion than they used to. There's travel um, soccer, there's year-round soccer, there's, you know, multiple leagues, people are engaged in actually competitive sports so many more hours per day over the course of a year than they used to be. It used to be, you know, you'd play multiple sports, you'd have your season, then you'd go on something else, and you'd, you know, maybe play for an hour or two after school. Now people are engaging this stuff kind of year-round, and so that's one of the reasons we're seeing so many more of these injuries. Yes? What kind of shoe surface is best? Um, it's not so much the shoe. You want to have a little bit of give, so something that's going to stick in the ground and not allow your leg to slide at all. Um, so there was some thought that maybe some of the early artificial turfs would have a higher incidence of ACL tear than... So Racquetball is a pretty low risk sport. Um, so you're, yeah, racquetball is a pretty low risk sport. So something that's going to give a little bit of a slide when you when you go to bite. You don't want it, the grip to be too hard. But racquetball is a pretty low risk sport. So if you said, okay, well, taking all that into consideration, what's the biggest risk besides just playing sports? What's the number one risk for tearing your ACL? It's being a female athlete. <laughs> So females, we know, for the, if a man and a woman are both playing basketball or soccer, the same number of hours, a woman is about six times more likely to tear her ACL during that activity than a man. So for all those reasons that we just mentioned. Um, if you want to look at it kind of in a, in a number that makes this seem a little more personal or a little more real, that means based on the number of hours playing for a typical college basketball player, female basketball player, one out of 10 will tear their ACL a year. So that's basically, I mean, most um, college basketball teams are gonna have 12 players, something like that. So somebody on that team, statistically, probably will tear their ACL each year. So it's happened, how do we make this diagnosis? Well, the history, remember we talked about, everybody seems to tell a fairly similar story. And so the history is probably the number one thing. I hear that story, and I start to get real nervous about, okay, yeah, what, what's just happened here as people start describing those, feeling a pop, feeling the knee shift, rapid swelling, all those things are concerning. And then we'll do what's um, a physical exam. We'll actually put our hands on the knee and feel what it feels like. And you can pull on the knee, it's called a Lachman test, and it's a subtle finding, but you can feel a little difference from knee to knee. Um, and if there's more translation, remember that ACL is stopping the knee from sliding forward or the lower leg from sliding forward. If, that, if there's more of that than there should be, it may very well mean that the ACL is torn. Once we've kind of got a pretty good idea of what's going on, we may order x-rays as well. About 5% of people will have this little fleck of bone you may be able to see up there. Um, that occurs in about 5% of people who've torn their ACLs. So if you see that on x-ray, that confirms the diagnosis. More often than that, x-rays are going to be normal though. Um, and we'll get an MRI. An MRI takes a look at the soft tissues, things that don't show up on plain x-ray. So the ligaments, the tendons, the cartilage. And we'll see a couple things. We'll actually see a torn ACL. This is the ACL right here. You see the fluid which shows up as white around there so that um, there's all that fluid. There's a tear coming across this area. And then there's frequently a very um, common bone bruising pattern right there. So that area and that area. That happens because remember that pivoting and shifting the knee makes when the ACL tears. So you go to plant, the leg starts to slide forward. There's so much force with that turn that the ACL pops and tears. It allows the leg to continue going and the back of the um, tibia and the center part of the femur smash together, leaving that footprint where those two areas collided. And then they pop back into position. So on the MRI, they're not lined up anymore. But when you see it, when you see those two things, you know that at one point that was touching that, and the only way you get that um, contact point is by tearing the ACL. How long does that stay in the MRI? That'll typically stay in the MRI. We'll see it for three to six months. So if you see somebody and they don't have that, then I'm always suspicious that this was an older injury. So what do we do about it? Well, it totally depends on each individual. So in general, People who are in their teens and 20s and want to get back to playing high school, college, or professional sports have a pretty hard time doing that without an ACL. 
if you're going to be doing high impact activity, planning, cutting, changing direction, if you try to get back to that without an ACL, then he's going to usually buckle and give way. And so those, sort, those individuals, I would typically recommend ACL reconstruction. Um, people in their 30s and 40s say, okay, well, what's your level of activity? And many people in that age group still are playing basketball or soccer or other activities on a frequent basis and want to be active and don't want to have that limitation. And so they'll choose surgery. Other people are more couch potatoes and say, oh, really doesn't bother me. I don't ever do any of those things. Probably don't need ACL reconstruction as long as there aren't other significant injuries in the knee at the same time. If you're kind of in your 50s and beyond, give me a pretty darn good reason why we need to do something about this. Because most people can live a very normal life without an ACL. Um, unless there are, again, other injuries. You've torn other ligaments. You've really damaged the meniscal cartilages. There are reasons why the 50 and over age group, I'd still recommend it, but not typically. We go about um, fixing the ACL by actually building a new one. So it's like a rope. So the, ligament, the ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament. A ligament is a strong cord-like or rope-like structure that actually holds two bones together. So when you tear a rope, you can't just repair the rope by sewing it back together. That's not strong. A rope's kind of woven, and you have to, you have to make one um, from uh, scratch. You can't just sew it back together. Same thing with the ACL. So to actually rebuild the ACL, we're building a new one. And we can take tissue from someplace else, either from someplace else on each person's body, or we can take it from a cadaver or a donor to use it to build a new ACL. There are different choices for that. Um, using your own tissue has advantages. Your body recognizes it as your own, um, and it heals in a little bit faster. So it's got a lower chance of re-tearing than if you use a cadaver tissue. So um, if athletes, teens, 20s, early 30s, who want to get back to really high-end sports, I wouldn't recommend using the cadaver tissue unless they're extenuating circumstances. Um, it's just got a higher rate of re-tearing. Using your own tissue is the way to go. And the most common sources for that are going to be either coming from your patella tendon, which is the center third of this structure right here. So on the front of your knee, where your kneecap, the strong tendon that attaches your kneecap down to your shin bone, and take the center third of that along with some bone from the patella or the kneecap and some right off the tibia. Or you can use um, your hamstring tendons. Those are the two most popular sources for graft for ACL reconstruction. Otherwise, there are options like we talked about with the cadaver choice. And that's a great choice for a lot of people who are a little less active, don't have quite the demands to be able to get back to the real high-end sports and as quickly, um, but still want to have that extra stability. Recovery after this. Most people are walking within the first one to six weeks. This largely depends on what else is going on. So if it's just an isolated ACL tear, there's no meniscus involved, um, you can usually be walking in within the first week or two. If there's a significant meniscal injury or other significant injuries involved with it as well, then typically um, you might be on crutches for up to six weeks. Usually by three months or so, you're starting to do some jogging. And then return to play is six to 12 months afterwards. The longer you wait, the safer it is. So the earliest I ever let people get back is at six months. It's safer to wait 12 as that we take, whether it's from your own tissue, from your own body, or from a cadaver, when we take that tissue from wherever it was and we move it to its new place, it dies. We've taken away its blood supply. New blood vessels need to grow into that. New cells need to grow into that. And that process takes time, and you can't feel that happening. And so the graft actually gets weaker for a long time after we've reconstructed it. It's the strongest it's ever going to be the first day we put it in there. And the body starts growing new blood vessels into it, new cells into it, and that weakens the graft. And then eventually, that starts to get stronger again. But that whole process takes a year or two to really fully mature. Um, so for the first several months afterwards, it's a lot weaker than it was when we first put it in there. And yet, you're starting to feel better. And that's the part I really start to get worried about. When athletes feel good, they say, I'm doing so well. My motion's good. My strength's good. Watch this, doc. You know, and they can and do stuff. And I start to get worried because they want to do stuff. They're trained. They're competitive by nature. They think they're going to work harder than the person next to them or somebody else. And that if they just work harder, they're going to get back even sooner. You can't speed up that biology. That part just takes time. And so that's something that, um, I mean, that's the thing that's great about working with athletes is because they're competitive. They want to get back. They're pushing themselves. They're trying to achieve. And so that's really fun and it's rewarding. Um, and it makes them have good outcomes because they're willing to put that time in. But you can't speed up that biology. And so just you need to put in the time. 
Adrian Peterson, um, NFL running back for the uh, Minnesota Vikings, is the poster child for successful ACL reconstruction. Came back eight months after surgery, went on to win the NFL rushing title that year. That's not a typical story. Most athletes trying to get back that early are going to um, not feel like they're quite as strong as they were before. Um, he was sort of a freak of nature. I mean, he was he had giant quadricep muscles and just built. I mean, he's an unusual physical specimen before this, and you know that allowed him to probably come back and continue to have an unusual career. But um, then you've got people like Derek Rose up on the upper corner there who 16 months later is still not back after ACL reconstruction and then finally gets back and then goes on to tear his meniscus on the other knee. So um, it's not necessarily typical that you're back at six months achieving the highest levels, but that's the earliest I'd ever let somebody get back. There are things that can be done to prevent ACL tears. And so um, probably the number one thing and the person who's most going to benefit from some of this is your younger female athlete. We want to train the muscles to land in a way that protects the ACL. And there have been a number of studies that have looked at this. Can we actually lower the um, incidence and the uh, chance of tearing the ACL by doing preventative exercises? And so some studies had groups of high school and college girls do these exercises and other similar schools not do them. And there was a difference in how many ACL tears they saw. And so what we're trying to do is train the legs to land toes or knees over toes so you're not coming in and buckling in like that and really recruiting those muscles in the appropriate sequence to have a safe landing. And so if you intervene at an early enough age, again, probably younger female athletes like middle school, early high school are most likely to benefit from this because they're still learning how to land. They're still developing. They're still maturing. If you can teach them early enough, then hopefully they'll remember that and that will just start to become muscle memory and, that, and that'll just become the way they, they move. There's still benefit in doing it even beyond that, but probably the people who are most likely to benefit are going to be at that earlier age. And then time off sports. I mean, I can't say that enough because this isn't, we will step aside from knees and everything else right now. The number of hours that young athletes are spending in sports is absurd. Um, so there are kids who are playing year-round baseball, year-round soccer, year-round all this other stuff. And so I see injuries to the shoulder, I see injuries to the elbow, I see injuries to the knee, to just every part of the body that can be prevented by not overusing those joints. And so a lot of times we're just abusing our bodies. So one thing you want to do to prevent ACL tears, play multiple sports. Take some time off. Do other things. There's a lot... Um, to life other than athletics. Sometimes it doesn't seem like that, but there is. Um, so that's um, all I had to say about ACL tears at this point. Are there questions so far? We'll move on to talk about meniscal tears then. So the meniscus is a shock-absorbing cartilage in the knee. You have one on the inner part and on the outer part. And you can see you can tear it. So the one thing that's unique about the meniscus is it's sort of like your fingernail it doesn't have a good blood supply, meaning that it doesn't really have the capacity to heal. And so just along this outer rim where it says red zone, that area has blood, but the majority of it you see doesn't. And so if you have a tear in any in that white area right there, it can't heal back together. It's like you tear your fingernail. It doesn't heal back together. It doesn't grow back together. You grow a new fingernail, but that part that was torn doesn't heal. The meniscus is different because when it's torn, it's torn and it doesn't grow back. So most meniscal tears can't heal. Some can. And so we see ones like this in this area, kind of out around where that blood supply is. Those can heal many times if we sew them back together, and so we'll do that. Other tears, and the majority of them, that are in this whiter area without the blood supply, and especially if they're one like this, um, they can't heal. And so we'll just trim up the damaged area. So that's what we would do if you have a torn meniscus. Now this is actually a more common injury than ACL tears. And this affects athletes, this affects non-athletes. So I see meniscal tears probably most commonly in 50 year olds who weren't even playing a sport. They say, I don't even know how I tore my meniscus. I've just been having this pain kind of on the inner part of my knee. It's bothering me at night sometimes. It hurts to sleep on my side with my knees together. It hurts if I'm squatting or pivoting or twisting. Um, that could be a meniscus tear. And it's really easy when you're playing sports and you're in your teens or 20s, that's usually an injury that causes this. When you're older, everything just starts to get not as firm. Um, so your skin gets not quite as firm. Everything else gets not quite as firm. Same thing happens with the meniscus. And so it's easier just to tear and break down over time. 
The most commonly injured ligament in the knee is the MCL. MCL stands for medial, meaning the inner part of the knee, collateral, meaning on the side, ligament. And again, a ligament is a strong rope or cord-like structure that connects two bones together. So on this model, MCL is on the inner part of the knee here. So it stops the knee from doing this. So that's a very, very commonly injured ligament in the knee. We grade them in terms of severity. One being it's just kind of stretched. A grade two being that it's actually partially torn. And a grade three MCL sprain being that it's completely torn. And how long it takes to recover and, and how conservative we've got to be with rehab um, is dependent on what grade that is. So grade one sprain in an athlete, lots of times they're feeling pretty good by a month or so. I've noticed I see a lot of people who are kind of past their peak athletic years and they'll get grade one MCL sprains. It can take a few months before they really stop having that pain in the inner part of their knee. With or without intervention? There is typically nothing surgically done for these. Okay. So this is one that typically is going to heal on its own. Um, grade two, these partial tears, um, typically month, two months, most people are starting to be able to get back to sports. And with the grade three, those complete tears, that's usually three months um, and sometimes beyond. Sometimes the grade three tears are so bad or depending where they're torn, if they're torn down um, closer to the tibia, down lower near the shin bone, those for whatever reason tend not to heal as predictably well and sometimes we'll need to go in surgically and rebuild that. But more often than not, MCL sprains are something that is a non-operative um, injury, meaning that there's no surgery necessary. It's going to heal and, and scar back in on its own. You might need a brace for a month. Um, there will typically be physical therapy or rehab involved in that, but typically not surgery for most MCL injuries. These are typically injured by falling and kind of twisting. I see, I've seen a number of people get run over by a dog you know, out for a walk and a dog hits them in the side of the knee. A lot of times with an athlete, they get hit on the outer side of the knee. Somebody comes in and tackles them from the side or runs into them from the side and that causes the knee to buckle in like that. And that, you can see how that will stretch and potentially tear the MCL. PCL tears. Remember, PCL stands for posterior, meaning in the back, cruciate, meaning cross, and ligament. And that's sort of the opposite of the ACL, whereas the ACL was in the front. Remember, they're making a cross right in the center of the knee. That posterior cruciate ligament is much less commonly injured than the anterior cruciate ligament. It typically occurs during a fall, um, so a fall and a flex knee, so like that little pictogram right there. And that force will frequently tear the PCL. On this model, the PCL is here in the back of the knee and it's running up towards the front and it's that fall driving the tibia back, which will frequently tear that PCL. We usually don't have to do anything surgically with these either. So these are typically non-operative injuries if they're in isolation meaning that you don't injure other things along with it. So most PCL tears hurt when they happen. There will be some knee swelling. The knee might feel a little unstable at first, but usually with some physical therapy and rehab and working on getting the quadriceps muscle firing again and getting good strength there, most people recover fairly nicely from this. I've seen a number of high school and college athletes, there are a number of professional athletes who've had this injury and get back to full function. Steve Eiserman for the Red Wings had this. And played many, many years very successfully without ever having surgery after this. With this injury, and with most injuries that involve something that happens inside the joint, there is a higher risk of developing arthritis later in life. But what we found is if you do something reconstructively, surgically, with the PCL, it does not lower the chance of developing arthritis years down the road. So some people have this injury, and, and I understand it. It's a tough concept to wrap your mind around thinking something's torn, it's not going to heal on its own, and we're just going to leave it that way. You know, you, you think, well, we need to fix everything. But we need to fix things if by doing that we're going to improve your function 
or we're going to improve your long-term health and condition. And with the PCL, typically you get back your full function and there's really been no shown benefit of actually reconstructing it in terms of decreasing the chance of developing arthritis down the road. So for most people, why bother? Um, I'm going back to the PCL one second, it's not unusual to have other ligament tears along with it. And so if it's more than just that direct blow to the front of the knee, people have some twisting or they're tackled or hit or some other mechanism, um, it's not unusual to tear other things in the knee, the LCL, some other ligaments in the back part. Sometimes you can tear all the ligaments at the same time. That's a disastrous injury and can, um, can cause lots of other problems. But um, so in, if there's other stuff involved as well, then typically the knee will be very unstable and we'll need to do PCL reconstruction. But if it truly is just the PCL, usually we don't need to do anything more. LCL tears, lateral, meaning side of the knee. Collateral, meaning again on the side of the knee. So lateral outer side of the knee, medial inner side. Um, collateral meaning on the outside of the knee and um, ligament, LCL. Relatively rarely torn in isolation. It can happen more commonly along with an ACL tear or PCL tear or some other injury. Picture down here is RG3, um, um, RG3 with the uh, Washington Redskins. He had an ACL reconstruction back in college, and then he ended up getting injured when he was playing for the Redskins. Um, and you can see that's not such a good position for the knee to be in right there. Um, and that injury is uh, tearing his ACL and also the LCL. So we'll see it in combined injuries. Isolated tears, it's just the LCL, it's nothing more. Frequently we'll be able to treat those non-operatively, just like with the MCL. Um, if it's other things, then the knee's pretty unstable. So an LCL and ACL, or LCL and PCL, then we'll frequently need to reconstruct both. And lastly, patella dislocations. The patella is the kneecap. So the kneecap can dislocate. This is a pretty common injury. Um, and it can happen sometimes with a trauma. Other times it happens just twisting and turning direction. Um, it, it doesn't have to be a real impressive thing. There are, again, this is kind of like the ACL. There's underlying mechanical things that might make some person at much higher risk than another person to dislocate their kneecap. Um, if it's a traumatic blow, meaning somebody got tackled and their kneecap was hit directly out of place, those tend to just be wrong place, wrong time sort of injuries. The injuries where you just kind of turned and all of a sudden your, your kneecap went out of place, those there's probably some underlying mechanical um, reason for that to happen. The kneecap sits in this little groove here and that groove matches up with the shape of the kneecap. I'll show you on the model. So the kneecap sort of wedge shaped. I don't know if people can see that. It's kind of got a wedge to it, almost like a little triangular shape. And it sits in this little triangular wedge shape on the femur. And so it rides back through that groove. Some people have a very flat kneecap and a very flat groove. So there isn't much of a track for that to go down. And it's easy for it just to fall off the side. Other people have a nice deep trough and, and wedge to that. And so the kneecap's kind of right on track the whole time. Those people are less likely to dislocate their kneecap. Some people have kneecaps that start kind of higher. So this is about the average starting position. Some people, their kneecap sits up a little bit higher. It takes longer as you bend your knee. So watch as I bend that knee. The kneecap's going to kind of ride down and go down through that groove. So if your kneecap starts off higher, there's going to be a longer period of time before it gets on track. So it's easier for it to get knocked out at some point. Some people wear this what's called the tibial tubercle, where the patella tendon attaches to the shin bone. Some people, that is relatively out towards the side, which means that naturally the kneecap wants to kind of follow it. And so there are all kinds of anatomical or structural mechanical reasons why somebody might be at more risk of tearing their, or dislocating their kneecap than another person. Um, but still, most of the time when it happens once, I say, okay, let's just work on physical therapy. Let's work on strengthening the muscles around it and see if hopefully you're one of the lucky people who doesn't have this happen again, or if it does happen again, it's rare, it's infrequent. If it starts happening all the time, there are things that we can do about it to actually um, rebuild a ligament in the knee called the MPFL. MPFL stands for medial patella, meaning kneecap, femoral, meaning femur or shin bone, um, ligament. 
and that's a ligament that's not pictured on this model, but it's on the inner part of the knee and runs up here and attaches to the edge of the kneecap. And its job is to help just guide the kneecap down into that groove and help to act just as kind of a check rein to stop it from wanting to fall over there. So these dislocations of the kneecap happen when the knee is straight or slightly bent. Once the knee is bent far enough, the kneecap sucked down into that little groove that it sits in and it's not going anywhere. So these injuries tend to occur with the knee straight or just a little bit bent. And that's when before it's entered into that groove and then it can get knocked off. So if it becomes a recurring problem for people, we can go in and we can actually just build a new MPFL um, surgically in that picture on the bottom. But most of the time, for every 10 people I see with a patella dislocation, I'm probably only actually ever going to operate on a couple of them. So most of the time, we don't need to do anything surgically. So that covers the main ligament injuries and meniscal injuries to athletes in the knee. We've still got time, so if there are things that weren't clear, just other questions, um, please feel free to ask. So the question was, will a knee brace help prevent an injury or prevent recurrence of an injury? And the answer to that is, for most things, no. There is one condition that a knee brace has actually been shown to make a difference. And that is for MCL injuries in football players, but not every football player, specifically offensive and defensive linemen. And the reason for that is they're getting chop blocked. People are hitting them low at the line of scrimmage. And then extra protection with kind of bars, either metal or carbon fiber bars along the side of the knee can help reinforce the knee and stop it from being injured. But most of these things, again, with the patella, with the kneecap, with ACLs, they tend to be kind of twisting injuries. And a knee brace can't really stop a twisting injury in the knee. And so there's this balance between an athlete's got to be able to move. You know? So to be out there and be effective, you've got to be able to cut and move and have your knee bend. And if you put something on that's so bulky and such, got such control over the knee that it can't twist or do anything, well, then you, you can't really play either. So, no, the braces tend not to make a difference. There are a ton of braces out there. And there are a lot of bracing companies that would like you to think that it makes a difference. And they've convinced a lot of people that it does, but there really isn't good evidence to show that. And so I think that it's reasonable to want to use a brace. You've had one of these injuries, and you think, I just want to do everything I can to try to decrease the chances of this happening again. So I'm not against using braces for a lot of these conditions if it's going to give athletes more confidence to get back out there because um, there's a huge mental hurdle to having this. You tear your ACL, you have any of these other injuries that we've talked about, you have to get knocked down a lot of times before you have the confidence to know you can get back up and you're going to be okay. It's a scary thing. It's a really scary thing for athletes to have this happen and then try to get back out and play. So most people, even if the knee is strong and by all objective measures they're doing really well, there's that psychological component to it too. So there's what makes sense. Hey, has it been shown to make a difference to use a knee brace? No. But is it going to make somebody feel more confident to get back out there? Well, if they feel like that, then yes, by all means, go ahead and do it. So the question is, what is a Baker's cyst? How does it come and is it preventable? So a Baker's cyst is a very, very common um, condition of the knee. I wouldn't even say injury or problem because for most people it's neither. What a Baker's cyst is, is a collection of fluid in the back of the knee. Inside our knees there is joint fluid. Our bodies make what's called synovial fluid and the average knee has less than a teaspoon of synovial fluid in it. We're making that constantly but the reason it doesn't just accumulate in there is because we're also absorbing it. So most of our bodies are making the joint fluid at the same rate that it's being absorbed. So as long as that's the case, then you typically don't develop a Baker's cyst. Some people are making it a little faster than it's being absorbed. And a Baker's cyst is where that fluid can collect in the back of the knee. If you think about the knee as being this structure here, and then take saran wrap and wrap it around the outside, and everything that you see here is now wrapped in saran wrap. That's called the joint capsule. So our shoulders, our hips, our knees, our elbows all have this capsule around. That's what keeps that fluid in. That's what makes this space different than the muscles and everything on top of it. They're actually different areas. And that fluid isn't just leaking in the muscle. It's being held tight in that joint. In the back part of the knee, there is a little weakness in that capsule. And so fluid can kind of escape 
through that little weakness in the capsule and almost cause it to start to pouch out and expand. Think about taking an uh, underinflated balloon and squeezing just a corner of it. And you'll see it kind of, the air will kind of bubble up into that area. It's kind of what it's like in the back part of the knee. It's a little weakness in the back part. So if there's fluid that's getting pumped in, either because there's a lot of fluid in the knee or just because that opening's there and you're being real active and you're kind of hydraulically pumping that fluid back into that area, that can kind of expand. Once it gets in there, there's not really much pressure in there, so it has a hard time getting back into the knee, and that's a Baker cyst. Those cysts will tend to um, shrink and grow depending on how much fluid there is in the knee, how active you're being. Um, as the fluid in the knee starts to go down or you're in a period of less activity, your body will absorb that Baker cyst, and so it will get smaller. You're real active, there's more fluid in the knee, it'll get pumped bigger. So those tend to go up and down. A lot of people just notice them by chance. They'll just be kind of feeling the back of their knee mosquito bite or something else and say, hey, what's that kind of fullness back there? What's that? And that's a Baker cyst. These are harmless conditions. They're usually painless conditions. Most people don't know they have them. They show up on MRIs real readily. And so people get an MRI because they have a knee pain for something else. And they'll come into my office with a report this long. There's this, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's a Baker cyst. And they say, well, what's this Baker cyst? And it's really, really common and it's harmless. And the answer is it's nothing. <laughs> you know, you've probably had it for years. This is not the cause of your pain. But we'll see it in people who have arthritis because those knees are making more fluid. We'll see it in people who have meniscal tears because those knees are making more fluid. And so people come in with pain. They've gotten the MRI for some other reason and now they are latched onto that Baker cyst. Well, that's not normal. Actually, it is kind of normal. We see them all the time and a lot of people have them. So there's really nothing to do for them. We can stick a needle in and drain them but they'll come right back. We can go in surgically and cut them out, but they'll tend to come right back because it's just joint fluid getting pumped into this little corner of the, of the knee. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Other questions? Yes. So you're right. Um, I've heard people say getting older isn't for sissies. <laughs> um, so yes, you have more aches and pains as you get older. When is it something to be worried about? If it's starting to really affect the quality of your life, if it's just general aches and pains, it's probably none of the stuff that we talked about here tonight. But if it's, hey, things are just kind of starting to hurt um, and it's affecting your mobility, it's your affecting your ability to do the things that you want to do, um, there may be, just because it's not one of these, doesn't mean that there's nothing serious going on or that there's nothing that can be done. There are any number of things that can be done for joint pain. Sometimes it's arthritis cortisone injections, certain medications, sometimes joint replacement um, are options. So for people who have aches and pains, if it's really starting to affect your life and you're finding that, God, I'm really uncomfortable all the time or I'm cutting back on activity, yeah, I think it's something to get checked out if it's not going away. So it's you wake up and you're sore, I wouldn't necessarily go get it checked out. It's going on for a month, might be something to get checked out if it's bothering you enough. Landing softly, you're recruiting all your muscles, so you're trying to cause that deceleration. So it's not you know, slam it on the brakes when you come to that landing. You want all those muscles to kind of be firing to help do more of a shock absorption for the knee. So you're not just, boom, you're letting your muscles help to slow down that, um, that joint reactive force rather than just the ground stopping it. Yeah, so the question was, is it stronger to have your own tissue used for ACL reconstruction than using the cadaver? And so what we know is that there is a lower chance of re-tearing the ACL if you use your own tissue than if you use the cadaver tissue for people in their teens and 20s. Once you get up into the 30s and 40s and beyond, the rates of re-injury are low in both, and so there's probably not as much of a difference. But absolutely, the, the chance of re-tearing the ACL, first of all, in competitive athletes, high school and college um, athletes trying to get back to competitive sports, in that subgroup of people, the chance of re-tearing the ACL is about 20%. And most of that's during the first two years. For people who are in their 30s and beyond, it's about 5%. So that's a big difference in terms of likelihood of tearing their ACL, um, depending on where you are in life, what kind of activities you want to do. In fact, for every extra additional year older that you are, your chance of tearing your ACL drops by 10%. So a 14-year-old athlete is 100% more likely to tear their ACL after ACL reconstruction than a 24-year-old athlete. So again, think about that year-round sports and how many, um, how many events and potential 
exposure opportunities for these injuries we're, we're having our kids do. It's fresher, it's also yours. Your body recognizes it as your own, and so there's probably a little less response to it. We talked about no matter where we take it from, if we take it from the cadaver or we take it from your own body, it's dead once we remove it. But your body needs to grow new blood vessels into it, it needs to grow new cells into it. That process happens faster with your own body. And so um, there are a number of other reasons too. So there's something about the way that the grafts are prepared. So you take a, a tissue from a cadaver and you need to make sure that the cadaver doesn't have disease or other issues. And so there were uh, ways of trying to sterilize that graft that actually made it weaker. We'd blast it with radiation to try to kill everything that could potentially be living on it. Turns out that actually weakened the tissue as well. So especially back in the 80s and 90s when, um, when the cadaver tissue was first being tried, some of the sterilization techniques that were used made it weaker. We don't do that anymore. There, we've got different methods of trying to make sure that there isn't disease associated with it. Our testing measures are much better. So we can actually test the cadaver with different and look for things like HIV, look for things like hepatitis C and other bacteria or viral infections. We've got good tests to check for that stuff. We didn't have that as much back in the 80s, and so we had to be a little more cautious in, in trying to sterilize it. So for all those reasons, uh, your chance of tearing your ACL is higher if you use the cadaver tissue than your own. So the question was, I mentioned earlier, it takes time for new blood vessels and new cells to grow into the replaced ACL. And the question was, but I thought that the ligament doesn't have blood vessels and cells. It does. So the ligament does have blood vessels and cells. That's why when you tear your ACL, it tends to swell rapidly. The knee gets um, really swollen really quickly. And that's because there's an artery that goes right to the ACL. And when you tear the ACL, most of the time that artery tears and just pumps blood into the knee. So yes, there are um, blood vessels that uh, supply the ACL and the PCL and all the ligaments in the knee. They're not a lot of them, so it's not like the muscle or other things that are really bloody vascular organs. But there are some, and those cells help to maintain the tissue. So, yes? The blood flow will come back to some extent. It will come back to some extent. Probably not as vigorously as it was to the ACL that you were born with, but there will be new vessels and stuff that grow into it. That's called neo, meaning new vascularization, meaning new blood vessels growing in. That's a good question. So the question was, how do we decide what to use? Do we use, the, do we use cadaver tissue or do we use your own tissue? Well, that we've kind of talked a little bit about. Younger athletes, I'm gonna definitely steer towards using your own tissue. Um, using the cadaver, using um, patella tendon versus using um, uh, hamstring tendon. How do you make that decision? Both graphs have been studied at length. There are hundreds of thousands of these done every year. Um, and so, worldwide, and so we've got good long-term data for both of those, and so we know that both graphs work well. You can have a great result, you can have a poor result with either. So it's probably not which graft you chose. There are subtle differences between them though. So some advantages, when we first started doing this, the very first thing that worked was the patella tendon. That was the first thing that was tried that actually worked. There were a lot of different things. First, tried sewing it back together. That didn't work. We just talked about hard to sew a rope back together, but sewing this back together doesn't work. Um, so then they tried using all kinds of different things that didn't work. And the first one that actually did was using the patella tendon. So that's sort of the gold standard that most tried and true, but that's been being done since the 1980s. There were some issues with it though. It's a bigger scar across the front of the knee. There's a bigger area of numbness typically out on the outer side of the knee away from that scar. There's a higher chance of having just persistent pain with kneeling or squatting activities um, in the front of the knee. Most people still won't have pain with that, but there's a higher chance of having that with your patella tendon than with some other things. Um, so there are enough issues that you start thinking, well, is there a different graft that we can use? And so that's what made the hamstring start to become popular. Smaller incisions, you have less chance of having pain in the front of the knee. There's some trade-offs with that too, because you might say, well, then why wouldn't everybody use the hamstring? Um, the patella tendon, the way we can actually fix it in, you got bone on either side of it. So when we drill tunnels up into the femur and the tibia, there may be a little bit faster incorporation of the, of the patella graft than of the hamstring, especially in the first several months. Um, so maybe if you said, hey, I wanna be back right at that six month mark. I'm gonna be pushing it, I wanna be back right at six months. I might feel a little more comfortable using the patella tendon than hamstring tendon for that. Um, patella tendon, we can actually kind of determine our own size because we're making a cut right down the center 
and saying, okay, we're, we know we're going to take the center third, we're going to try to make that a 10 millimeter graft, and that's the size we're going to use. Hamstrings, you can't really choose your size. It is what it is. However big that tendon is, um, we can take either one or two of them, but still you're kind of left with whatever that size is. So there's a little less flexibility with that. So they're kind of little, little idiosyncrasies that might make one graft better for one person than for another. I'll always individualize it. So I have a discussion with any patient who's torn their ACL. Here are the different graft options. Here's what, I, you know, here's what we can do. Here are the pros and cons and what makes most sense for you. So for a softball or a baseball catcher, somebody who's going to be squatting, kneeling, a plumber, somebody who's going to be doing a lot of stuff down on their knees, probably steer away from the patella tendon, higher chance of having persistent pain with squatting. For somebody who isn't going to be doing those things, is more concerned about kind of the cosmetic appearance of the knee, um, might steer more towards the hamstring. So there's different little things that might make you choose one or the other. Yes, so things that you can do just in general. Core strength is really, really important for stability, for control of the knee, for the control of how the hip moves. So a lot of people, and historically this was ignored, you know, people think about they're gonna go work out, they're gonna go to the gym, they're gonna bench press, and they're gonna do some curls, and they're gonna squat, they may do some leg extensions, things like that, that are just working the muscles right around the joint. Those really don't affect, I mean, how often in life are you having to do that motion, just isolated, or curling here, or just doing this? I mean, those aren't really very functional moves. So there's been a kind of a shift in thought in exercise science and training that we want to do things that are more functional movements. And so we want to really be recruiting multiple muscles at the same time. And so a lot of core strength where you're working on your, your abs, your glutes, your low back, um, so single leg balance, single leg squats, lunges, leg press, all those things are going to be good for trying to help control function around the knee. So the question was, I injured my knee playing tennis a few months ago and now my knee feels like it's going to buckle. That's probably coming, coming from some pain from underneath the kneecap. Um, that's called chondromalacia patella or some softening of the cartilage underneath the kneecap really, really common problem. And when you start to get the sensation that there's going to be a little pain, even if it doesn't register in your brain yet, it's just like if you take a reflux hammer and go whack and your leg involuntarily does that, even though you don't make it do that, you're not telling your knee to kick, it just does that. There's that same reflex loop when your body is about to start to experience discomfort coming from underneath the kneecap or from around the patella tendon, it will send that little reflex and it will cause your quadriceps muscle to misfire. And so it will make it feel like your knee is going to buckle or give way. So probably not anything that's torn or anything that's structurally wrong with your knee. It feels unstable because it's a dynamic thing. The muscle isn't firing appropriately, but it's probably not anything. Um, I, I haven't examined you. I can't say for yeah, sure, but, but just based on what you described, that would be my guess. Yeah. Many times it will, sometimes physical therapy to work on um, some of those uh, exercises we were talking about, some stretching um, exercises can be helpful too. So the question was, okay, so the question was lots of running at an earlier age and now having some just pain and loud noises in the knee, what might be going on despite normal tests? Um, hard to say. If everything's been normal, um, I, to make that diagnosis when you've seen, sounds like multiple people and they haven't been able to uh, say, trying to make that diagnosis without examining you just based on that, I don't have a, a great answer for you. Yeah. For other than to say, having a noisy knee is not necessarily a problem. A lot of us have elbows, hips, knees, joints that make snap, crackle, pop. And so I see a lot of people come into the office and say, God, I'm having all this trouble in the knee. Okay, well, what's the trouble? It just makes so much noise. Is it painful? No, but it just makes so much noise. Don't worry about it. You know, that doesn't mean anything wrong. There are all kinds of reasons for a noisy knee. And so if you're getting kicked out just because the knee's noisy, yeah, so if it's painful, that's a different situation. But if it's just noisy, then that's no reason to, to be concerned. But pain, um, there are a lot of potential reasons for pain. And we don't always know everyone. So despite MRIs, despite... CT scans and x-rays, sometimes you just say, God, I can't fully explain this. So the question was, is there other, after a knee injury, do you do the MRI right away or do you wait? Um, do you do physical therapy first? The answer is it totally depends. Um, if we feel like there's a, a high suspicion of an ACL tear or something else, I'm not going to necessarily bother with, let's just do therapy for a while and see how you do. If we think that there's probably something structural going on, I'm going to be 
more eager to order the MRI. If I say, gal, your history isn't real suspicious, and physical exam, I don't really see anything unusual on x-ray, or I do, I see this problem, but it's not anything structurally wrong with the knee, we need to work on some other things, then yeah, then physical therapy is frequently a starting point. But if I clearly identify, I think I've got a pretty strong reason to believe of a specific injury, one that might require surgical treatment, I'm probably going to go right to the MRI. So that just, it's a case by case thing. Got time for one more question if anybody has any other questions. So having an ACL tear increases your chance of developing arthritis down the road. Um, so the, the question was, does having an ACL repair increase your chance of developing arthritis down the road? Having an ACL tear increases your chance of having, developing arthritis down the road. There are, whether or not surgery increases your chance of developing arthritis down the road, um, probably not. And it may help prevent it because one of the things that will happen with an ACL tear is we'll get meniscal tears secondarily to that. All that extra pivoting and shifting in the knee without an ACL will typically lead to a tear of the meniscal cartilage with time. And that, we know, meniscal tears are associated with ACL, which are associated with arthritis. So um, I don't tell people that they need to have their ACL reconstructed to try to prevent arthritis down the road. There's no good evidence to suggest that's the case. Tell people to have their ACL reconstructed if they want to get back to high-level sports and they're worried about stability in their knee, but not because of what might happen 20 or 30 years down the road. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you.